Lord, thank you that you have defeated the enemy. And um, thank you that even though the enemy is strong, he's smart, he's, he's deceptive, he's manipulative, that you have defeated him and you've given us victory over him. Jesus, I pray that you would um, give me the words to speak today and help me to share your heart today, God. I pray that each of us would just, that you would build up our faith so that we would know that we can stand firm, so that we can stand strong, so that we can resist any one of the enemy's temptations. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So just a little bit of review. So last week, uh, so we spent a lot, a long time looking at, you know, the fact that we are in a spiritual war, that we can't get out of it, that we have an enemy who's trying to destroy us, who's trying to take us out. Uh, John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came to bring life. So we're stuck in this battle where the enemy wants to take us out, but Jesus has given us life. He's given us victory, but that doesn't mean it's not all guaranteed that everything's going to go great because we have an enemy that wants to, to hurt us and destroy us. Um, and, so, and then we spent a long time looking at the character of this enemy, the, his names and his nature, what things he does, how he tries to affect us. Um, and then last week I shifted gears, talked about the fact that Jesus has defeated the enemy. So I want to share just some of those, some of those verses quick before going on to new stuff. I kind of want to continue on with that idea today that Jesus has defeated the enemy. But let me, let me share some of the three main verses from last week. Genesis 3.15, uh, right after Adam and Eve sinned, um, God placed a curse over the serpent. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He, referring to Jesus, the offspring of the woman, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The NIV says he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The idea is that in the midst of this spiritual war, God is promising way back in the beginning when the war started, he promises that I will send a deliverer and yeah, your serpent, you're going to, to hurt his heel. You're going to strike his heel, but he will crush your head, um, completely obliterate his power, destroy his ability to, to hurt us. Colossians 2.15, Paul writes, Through the cross, God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Jesus. The words that Paul is using here, if you look at the Greek words, it's very, it's very militaristic words where he's talking about the complete and utter decimation of our enemy. That Jesus totally destroyed him, disarmed him, stripped him of all his power, stripped him of all of his, his, uh, his weapons, stripped him of all of his armor and paraded through the streets, embarrassing him, putting him to shame as, as, as a defeated enemy. That's the words that Paul is using here about how Jesus conquered Satan. Uh, 1 John 3, 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. D Jesus didn't just come to uh, make us feel a little better or help us to struggle through life until one day we get to go to heaven and we, 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 we feel good in heaven. But he came to destroy every work of the devil in our lives. Uh, he came to destroy sin, to free us from the power of sin, to forgive us of sin, and to free us from sin. He came to destroy sickness in our lives, torment, fear, depression, worry, anxiety, um, all, all of these works of the devil, Jesus came to destroy those so that we would live in victory and live in freedom. Amen? Yes. All right, so I want to continue on with that this week um, and talk about two of the uh, Jesus' most powerful weapons that he also has given us in, in spiritual warfare, and that's power and authority. And what we see on the earth, is, or what we see in the Bible, is that not only did Jesus destroy, it, confront what the enemy was doing, and have victory over him, but Jesus demonstrated that he had complete power, complete authority over every power of the enemy. So the, the devil, Satan, at one point in time, and even to this day, but especially before Jesus, he had a level of authority on the earth. Uh, Adam and Eve, they, you know, they sinned. They allowed sin into the world. And so they, they were set up on the earth to rule. To, to, people were given the earth to, to take care of it and to subdue the earth. And yet they followed Satan's deception. They sinned. They rebelled against God. And in doing that, they opened the door for the enemy to come in. And effectively, they gave their authority over to the devil and allowed him to come and rule on the earth in their place. And so the devil, from, from that point until when Jesus came, the devil had a certain level of illegitimate authority on the earth to do 
to do to bring his destruction and to to fight the things of God in a bigger way than he has now. Um, even in Luke chapter four, when uh, when Jesus is in the wilderness, he's tempted by the enemy, and uh, the devil says in uh, verse five. Well, it says, and the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. The devil wasn't lying. You know, he takes Jesus up and he shows him all the kingdoms, all the nations. And he says, I, if you worship me, I will give you all of this because it has been the authority, the power of these kingdoms has been delivered to me. He wasn't lying. He wasn't making that up. Yeah, the, it had been delivered to him. Adam and Eve, humanity had surrendered their authority and their power on the earth and gave it to the devil, gave it to the enemy. And so when he's tempting Jesus, he's not lying. He could give that, he had that authority and he could give it to Jesus if Jesus would just worship him. But obviously, Jesus refused to worship him, resisted him. And, um, and what, what the enemy didn't know was that, or I don't, maybe he knew it or not, but what he didn't realize, what he didn't take into account was that Jesus was the ultimate authority. Yeah, the enemy had some authority delivered to him, but it was an illegitimate authority. It's not real. It's not that he's the real king of the earth. Jesus is. Jesus has the real authority. And throughout his life, what we see is Jesus is constantly showing and demonstrating that he has real power and real authority over every power of the enemy. Yeah. Right after um, the temptation in the wilderness, Jesus, uh, he, so he's, t he's in 40 days he's in the wilderness being tempted by the enemy. And he resists this, you know, the devil's showing all of his power and all of his authority. Jesus resists that. And then to show that he has, um, has power over the enemy, uh, Luke may, goes to uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Jesus is in a synagogue in Nazareth, and he just declares the power and authority that he has. Verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord. So uh, Jesus took the scroll and he reads from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim, where we go here? Uh, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So this is why Jesus came. It's like he's making a proclamation. He just defeated, he just resisted the enemy. He, just, he, was, he saw the enemy's kingdoms, the enemy's power, the enemy's authority, and now he's making a proclamation that this is why he came, to set people free to undo the things that the enemy had done. That the enemy seems to have authority, but Jesus' authority trumps the enemy's authority. Uh, in verse 20, he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In case there's any question, you know, as he read that, I'm sure the people that were gathered in the synagogue, I'm sure the way Jesus read it, people were like, wait a minute, is this him? And like, there must have been something in the way he read it that just caused something to click in their, in their minds and their hearts. But then in case there's any question, he just was very clear. He says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It's like he's saying, this is me. This is why I came to fight what the enemy has done and to undo the damage that he brought on the earth. Now, not only did Jesus proclaim this, but then um, right after that, then Luke talks about or shows how Jesus actually demonstrated his power over the enemy in verse 31. Um, it's almost right after he, he reads these verses and makes this declaration. Verse 31, he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. So not only did Jesus declare, this is me. I have come to undo what the enemy has done, showing that he's got authority over the enemy. But now he's like, he's demonstrating it. He's showing it so everybody can see. Okay, Jesus just declared that this is why he came. Now he's casting demons out and they're making connections in their minds going, okay, Jesus' power, Satan's power is here. His authority is here, but Jesus' power is greater than that. The, they just recognize that he's walking in power. He's walking in authority. Um, Peter says in Acts 10.38 about it, 
God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good, <clears throat> doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. That's just what Jesus did. Everywhere he went, he started going from city to city to city, preaching the gospel, declaring the kingdom of God, healing the sick, rebuking demons, setting people free, undoing the damage that the enemy had done, demonstrating that he had complete and total power and authority on the earth. Ramsey McMullen in his book, Christianizing the Roman Empire, he talks about Jesus and his, quote, manhandling of demons, humiliating them, making them howl, beg for mercy, tell their secrets, and depart in a hurry. I love that. How Jesus manhandled demons. <laughs> it's like, that's awesome. Um, in the book, The Real Satan by James Callis, he says, A war is going on. Cosmic war. Jesus is the divine invader sent by God to shatter the strength of Satan. In that light, the whole ministry of Jesus unrolls. Jesus has one purpose, to defeat Satan. That's why Jesus came, to demonstrate that Satan is defeated and to cast them out of people, to undo the work he'd done, to heal those that Satan had made sick, to bring hope to those that were hopeless because of the work that Satan had done in their lives, to bring healing and restoration and life where the enemy had come and brought death. Amen. 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 Yeah. When Jesus came, he essentially declared that a new kingdom had come. Uh, Matthew, um, so Luke, Luke's version of Jesus' first, well, Luke's memory of Jesus' first message was, you know, that from, from Luke 4, him in the synagogue and reading from Isaiah. Uh, Matthew says his memory of Jesus' first message is in Matthew 4, 17, right after the temptation, right after he, he, he conquers the enemy, resists the enemy's temptation. It says in Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Essentially, the message here, the, the idea of what he's saying here is, you know, repent. Get your life in order. Get ready because there's a new kingdom coming. And, and there's a new kingdom coming with new rules, with new, a new way of life, a new culture. I'm that king. And so get ready because I'm bringing this new kingdom coming. Um, and it's kind of, it's a little bit like, well, have you guys seen the, the old Disney Robin Hood movie? Yes. Okay, one of my favorite movies ever. So cool. Levi says it's so cool. <laughs> Our cameraman loves it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely one of my favorite movies. And, you know, when I think about Jesus coming, it's a little bit like, um, okay, so you've got Robin Hood and all these guys getting oppressed by um, Prince John. He's not the real king. The real king, Richard, um, is gone fighting, fighting the Crusades. And so his brother, Prince John, he's this weaselly loser prince who, you know, they, what do they call him? The, uh, shoot, what is it? The something, the, the fake king of England or something like that. Uh, the something, I don't remember. But anyway, they have a song about him being the, the illegitimate, illegitimate king of England. But he's just oppressing them. He's got his henchmen that go around and extort them for more money. And they're living in poverty. They're living, there's crime that's rampant. And this fake king is just reaping all this... All, all these rewards from, from the abuse that he's giving on the people. But then at the, so the people are suffering and there's nothing they can do about it because Prince John is in power even though it's illegitimate. But at the end of the movie, who comes back? King Richard. King Richard comes back and he kicks Prince John out. He brings blessing and goodness to the land again. <laughs> That's like what Jesus is declaring here in Matthew 4. He, he's, he's declaring, look, I get it. There's an illegitimate king here. I get it how he's been tormenting you. He's been hurting you. He's been destroying your lives. But a new king is coming with a new kingdom, and he's not going to, the, the old king isn't going to be able to do this stuff anymore. That's repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah. George E. Ladd wrote a book called The Gospel of the Kingdom, which I, I highly recommend. It's, it's, I, I think it's from the 40s or 50s maybe. Um, but it's all about what is the kingdom of God, and what does it mean that Jesus preached the kingdom of God. Um, great book. So in this book he says, our Lord's ministry and announcement of the good news of the kingdom were characterized by healing and most notably by the casting out of demons. He proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and he demonstrated the good news of the kingdom of God by delivering men from the bondage of Satan. What is the gospel of the kingdom? What means the announcement that the kingdom of God has come near? It is this, that God is now acting among men to deliver them from the bondage of Satan. It is the announcement that God, in the person of Christ, is doing something. If you please, is attacking the very kingdom of Satan himself. 
The exorcism of demons is proof that the kingdom of God has come among men and is at work among them. Everywhere Jesus went, he preached that the kingdom of God has come. He cast out demons. He healed the sick. He demonstrated that, that he had total power and total authority over every demonic power and demonic influence on the earth. Um, I want to look a little bit at Mark 5. Uh, this, is, this is how Jesus responded to probably the fiercest infestation of demons that we, that we see in the New Testament. This is the story of Legion. Mark 5, starting in verse 1. <laughs> For those of you in Watertown and, and for Lisa, Levi just went, ooh, when I, said, when I mentioned it was Legion. <laughs> ooh, I like this story. not Legion. <laughs> All right, verse one, Mark 5, verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Um, this guy was in really rough shape. Um, it, it describes him as, you know, that he's living among the tombs. Luke adds that he was naked. Uh, Matthew say, says about him, he was so fierce that no one could pass that way. Night and day, he's, he's cutting himself with, with stones. Um, they try to chain him up, but these demons are so strong in him that he's actually able, able, able to break these chains and get himself free. And then Mark later on says, no one had the strength to subdue him. So this is a guy that is completely overwhelmed by the enemy. Um, someone that no one else could help, but he, he's, he's no match for the power of Jesus. Verse 6, if we move, a little, move along a little bit further to verse 6. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him, despite the grip of the enemy, despite the fact that this guy was totally consumed by demons and they, had, they seemed to have complete authority over his life. He sees Jesus from afar and the, the demons inside him propel him, compel him to go run toward Jesus because they recognize the, the authority that Jesus has. And Matthew actually, Matthew actually clarifies the situation and says that it was the demons in him that actually speak out, speak, speak to Jesus. Um, so verse seven, and crying out with a loud voice. So it's the man crying out, but it's the demons in him compelling him to cry out. Crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. See the authority that Jesus walks in here? He shows up and this guy that nobody can help. And these demons have completely consumed him, but they see him from afar. Sorry, I'm going to knock my glasses off. I'm getting excited here. They see him from far away and these demons in him, they recognize the authority of Jesus. And so they go and they, they shout out, what, what, why are you here? Are you going to cast us out before, before the time? And they, they, they beg him for an answer because Jesus has authority. Uh, moving up to verse 9, Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. Um, at, in Roman history, the uh, number, so a legion was a group of Roman soldiers and it varied between on the low end, 1,000 soldiers, and on the high end, 11,000 um, at various times in history. During this time of history, it was about 5,000, uh, typically, but sometimes guys would do it a little bit different. Um, and so, what, what, however, I don't think the Bible is giving us a, you know, a specific number here. If the Bible wanted to say how many demons were in him, it would have said spe a specific number. But I think the idea is we're supposed to know there's a lot of demons in this guy. Yeah. They have power over his life, and they're tough, like a Roman legion. You know, you don't want to go against the whole Roman legion and you just got little rocks to chuck at him. <laughs> Leave us alone! So this is, a, this is a guy that's overwhelmed by the power of the enemy. Uh, verse 10. So he says, My name is Legion, for we are many. Uh, and he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. See who has authority here? It's not the guy with demons. It's not the demons themselves. It's not the legion. Even this legion of demons has to beg Jesus. They have to come before Jesus and implore him and beg him because Jesus has the authority. The demons don't have the authority. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. <laughs> I was thinking about how humiliating that had to have been. <laughs> Here's this guy with a legion of powerful demons, and they're like, Please, Jesus! Let us go to the pigs! We just want to go to the pigs! And so Jesus is like, okay, fine. You can go into the filthy animals. <laughs> go into the pigs. They go into the pigs and the pigs go crazy and they drown themselves. So Jesus still wins and the demons are still cast out because right. the pigs died. Yeah. This is the power Jesus has. This is the authority he has. You know, the, the scriptures make it clear that, yeah, we, have, we see two, two things at the same time in the Bible that 
Satan is tough. Demons are intense and they're strong. They're manipulative. They are fierce and alone. You, you were no match for them. Um, but so we see that very clear that the enemy is strong and we got to be aware of that. But we see very clear that Jesus has more power, more authority. And compared to Jesus, the enemy is a bug. The enemy is just a little, a little gnat that you just find on your arm. You just squish it. He's gone. He's nothing compared to Jesus. John, um, well, and, every, and then we see everywhere Jesus goes, he's got the same response. When there's someone who has demons, Jesus casts them out. We never see Jesus going, oh, gosh, I don't know. What do I do? This guy's got demons. No, anybody who has demons, Jesus casts them out. He's not afraid. He's not intimidated by them. He has power over them. John Wimber writes, Jesus never met a demon that he liked. <laughs> I like that. Now, he's not making peace with these demons. Um, Shared a few stories about, about Uganda. Well, here's, here's another one. I think some of you have heard this, but some of you haven't. So um, even for those who have heard it, bears repeating. Um, one, of, one of the craziest demon stories that I, I had was uh, this time in Uganda. In Uganda, like I shared before, it's just full of witchcraft. Everybody does witchcraft. Even, even in the churches, a lot of times uh, pastors will do witchcraft. And you know, so when, we, when we've been there, we have to preach a lot. We'll do these pastoral con pastors conferences and we'll preach against witchcraft because a lot of these pastors are doing witchcraft. Um, and so witchcraft is just a part of their life. And um, they, don't, they, they realize how evil it is, but they see the power there. And so a lot of people are drawn to it. Uh, well, there's one village where we ministered. Um, there was be years before we got there, probably about uh, 30 or so years before we got there, there was a young woman in the village that was married to a man um, and she, they could not have kids. She, she couldn't get pregnant. And so they went to a witch doctor and the witch doctor told them, do all this funky stuff and then you'll be able to get pregnant. So they did the funky stuff um, and then she got pregnant. And then when it came time to deliver the baby, uh, and I'm just reporting what they told me. So when it came time to deliver the baby, uh, she was pregnant with twins and out came first a little baby girl and next a live snake. That's what they told me. Uh, and maybe they got confused. Maybe it was the snake was happened to be there. It didn't actually come out. Or maybe it was the umbilical cord. But I think you would know the difference. Or maybe the spiritual world is bigger than we realize. Um, I've heard a number of weird stories with stuff like this where uh, in my brain, my brain, you know, I, I, I was trained. I went to school for rocket science, uh, aerospace engineering. So my my brain is like, that doesn't compute. <laughs> How does that work? But the spiritual realm is real. Um, so, OK, regardless of what really happened, the parents took this as a sign that they had to dedicate this new baby girl to demons. And so they went to the local witch doctor, gave the baby girl to the witch doctor who then started using her as like a, a storehouse for, well, they, they said, okay, because of this, this thing that happened with the, the snake being born at the same time, they took that as a sign that she had some supernatural power to be a, a storehouse for spiritual power. And so what that meant was from the time that she was a little girl until the time she was in her 30s, um, she was used, raped repeatedly by men that would come have sex with her. And they believed that when they had sex with her, they would deposit a part of their spiritual power in her that they could access at a later time in the future. And so she was used by this witch doctor for decades to, as, as a sex slave, essentially, um, and farmed out to whatever guys around wanted some extra power or just to get their kicks with a girl. Um, then when she got older, it's actually a, a pastor in the area who was doing witchcraft, heard about her, and he wanted more power. And so he actually married her, not, you know, a, a loving marriage, but he used her as a sex slave. And then he had a number of other women in the area that he was doing the same thing with. He would keep them in these huts and he would go and have sex with them, deposit supernatural power there, have sex with another one, put power there. And so he was growing in this spiritual power, at least in his mind, by doing this stuff. And so this girl was treated for decades like this, um, completely ruined by demons as a result. Uh, she, she was tormented by nightmares every night. She had hallucinations. She couldn't tell what was real and what was imaginary. Um, she would hear voices. Demons would just show up and start talking to her. And then meanwhile, night after night after night, she's getting raped by men in the village. Um, and so she, we went to this village to, to uh, do a little crusade there. And after preaching one night, she came forward to get prayer. Um, so we had no, I had no idea you know, the, the background or anything, but she comes forward. And uh, we put our hands on her. Me, it was me and a couple other 
um, African guys, and I think maybe one or two guys from Romania. Um, I can't remember who all was there at the time, but a number of us put our hands on her and my friend Richard, who's a Ugandan um, evangelist, basically, um, who he's my connection to Uganda. And so a bunch of us put our hands on her. And as soon as you know, Richard was the one kind of in the front, and as soon as he put his hands on her, um, she just freaked out. And she starts clawing at him and actually drew blood. And she starts clawing at the rest of us. And later on, she told us that when we put our hands on her, it felt like burning, fiery claws ripping her skin off. And so that's just the demons in her that were responding to that, you know, because we were, were full of the presence of God. And the, the, to the demons, yeah, the presence of God is terrifying. So we put our hands on her. She starts clawing at us and screaming. It took like four or five of us strong guys, you know, clearly strong, look at me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it took like four or five, five of us tough guys to pull her off of Richard and like hold her down so that we could pray for her. And then she just, the demons in her, throw her onto the ground. And then she's writhing on the ground like a snake, alternate, alternating between screams and hissing. And so we're like, okay, clearly demons. Uh, yeah. So we, we put our hands on her. We get down there and we're just praying for her. I, I think it was about half hour, and maybe not half, 15 minutes of prayer. We're just rebuking these demons. And Africans, they know how to pray. Um, they understand the power of demons. They understand the power of evil and darkness. And so none of them were scared, going, oh, what do we do? But they, they, we all got in there and just start rebuking these demons, declaring that Jesus has power, Jesus has authority, and eventually these demons left. She was completely set free. Um, she's, she got plugged into the church. Take, well, she was able to leave that, her husband, um, which earlier for years she tried to leave this man, but the, she'd get away and then the demons would force her to go back to this guy. But now that the demons were out, she were, were cast out. She was able to leave this guy, got plugged into the church, and she's completely delivered from the power of the enemy. That's what Jesus does. It doesn't matter how strong the enemy is. It doesn't matter how terrifying he is. Jesus has power and authority over him. Another quote from uh, George E. Ladd here from the Gospel of the Kingdom. Jesus' power over demons was a disclosure that the powers of the age to come have invaded the present evil age. It was the proof that the kingdom of God, which belongs to the age of the future, when Christ comes in glory, has already penetrated this age. Satan is not yet destroyed as he will be when he is cast into the lake of fire. He is not yet bound as he will be then, yet God's kingdom is active. God is attacking the kingdom of Satan. What we see in the life of Jesus is proof that a new age began, that a new kingdom began, that though the enemy had reigned as an illegitimate king, now the real king had come to show that, to bring his power and his authority to, def to defeat and destroy the works of the enemy. Um, this power and authority that Jesus walked in, so he demonstrated it in his life. And he showed, you know, everywhere he's going, he's casting out demons, he's rebuking the enemy, he's showing power over sickness, power over storms at sea even, power over death. Um, he's he's um, dismantling the kingdom of God and demonstrating, showing, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that he has power and authority over the enemy. But that didn't stop at, at, at his death and resurrection. That only increased because after he died and rose again and ascended to the right hand of the Father, he, he, he was lifted to a place of complete and total power and authority. So the authority that Jesus had on the earth over, over, the, enemy, he, over the enemy, he made that very clear. But now he has even more authority than, than even when he was walking on the earth. Matthew 28, verse 16, after Jesus rose from the dead and before he ascended to heaven, uh, verse 16, it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and, and when, they, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth. Meaning everything from heaven to the earth and everything in between. That all authority was given to Jesus. So Jesus demonstrated on earth that he had all power and authority. That the enemy's authority was nothing compared to his. And now that he rose again from the dead, now he's just declaring it so nobody questions it. So we all know clearly. He's like, look, all authority is mine. Every bit of authority. It doesn't matter how tough the enemy looks. It doesn't matter his illegitimate authority because it's not real. Jesus has all authority. M Matthew Henry writes about this verse. God set Jesus in as king, inaugurated and enthroned him. Yeah, right. That's what happened after his death and resurrection. It's like God said, all right, 
boom, you're the king now. You're in charge now. He has all power. He has all authority, not the enemy. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. He has all power, all authority. Doesn't matter how tough the enemy looks. It doesn't matter how strong he seems in your life. It doesn't matter how long you've been struggling with, with, with some sin or with some addiction or how long you've been tormented by him. Jesus has all power and all authority. Good. So what does it mean that Jesus has power and authority? Well, uh, let's look at authority first. The word authority is exousia, meaning pr privilege, right, or delegated influence. The power of him whose will and commands must be submitted to by others and obeyed. We see this word used a number of times in the New Testament. Uh, one is Acts chapter 9, when uh, uh, Paul is going around um, harassing Christians, beating them up, and bringing them to, uh, in, to the prison. It says that he had authority from the chief priest to go do this stuff. Not everybody could go beat up Christians and bring them to prison, but Paul had authority. He had delegated power from someone that was higher up so that he could go and bring uh, Christians to prison. In Matthew 21, Jesus cleanses the temple. Um, and when he does that, the priests demand to know, by whose authority have you done this? Because th that's not something everybody could do. You know, you, you're an average guy. You could, don't get to go into the temple and start making whips and whipping animals out and throwing the money, the, the tables of money, uh, money over and uh, kicking the money changers out. Thank you, Levi. Um, <laughs> Not everybody could do that. And so the chief priests, they see Jesus doing this, and they're, they're probably thinking in their minds, they're like, okay, so maybe the priests could do this. Maybe the Romans had power to do this. Maybe the governors, maybe the king would be allowed to do this. But who's this carpenter? Who's this rabbi? He's nobody. What, what makes him think he can do this? But Jesus had a higher power, a higher authority that delegated that power to him, so he had the right to go and do this thing that not everybody could do. That's authority. That, so that's the authority that Jesus walked in, not an authority that everybody had at the time. He had delegated power from God, the Creator, the Lord, the King of Kings, to go and, and, and do things that most people at the time couldn't do. And they recognized that. And even the demons recognized it, that Jesus walked different. Um, authority, you could think of it like a, a police officer's badge, or, or maybe his car, or the lights, or the siren. When we, when we first came back from Romania, a lot of you know this story about my, my run-in with the law. <laughs> we were, uh, I was used to how Romanians drove and their flexibility in terms of obeying the, the laws and things like that. And so, you know, uh, in Romania, you would just drive however you could get there fastest and mostly safe. Uh, and so I did a number of things that you shouldn't do in America. Well, when we first came back, I, did, I was still adjusting. And so I was driving on Highway 60. There was this car in front of me that was driving painfully slow and uh and it was a, it was a what do you call it no passing zone and there was a car i could look, look ahead and there was a car coming the opposite way toward me and i was like i could get through this <laughs> and so i went into i crossed into the opposite lane you know no passing zone so i crossed into the opposite lane zoom ahead and then suddenly i realized crap that was a police that is a police and i get over there the guy the police does a u-turn siren goes on the lights go on i see it in my rear view mirror and i'm like okay sorry all right i pull over and uh, he didn't have to pull a machine gun out. He didn't have to open up, you know, rocket launchers in the car like Mad Max and start <laughs> launching stuff at me. No, I just recognized. I saw, okay, this guy's a police. He has authority. I'm pulling over. And I didn't get a ticket, amazingly. <laughs> um, but that, that's authority. That, you know, that, that the, the power that that guy has, the police officers have power delegated to them because they're officers of the law. And so they don't have to start waving their guns around and start shooting at you every time that you see them. You go, oh, that's a police officer. Uh, you know, the speed limit's 55. Now I'm going to go 45, <laughs> like everybody does. You know, we freak out. Um, but that's authority. You see the cop's car, and you're like, okay, got to watch myself around him. Or, or if something, someone's acting up at the mall, and he pulls out the badge, and he's like, settle down. I'm an officer. Just warning you, chill out. That's authority. Mm -hmm. So Jesus walked in that kind of authority. Um, in terms, when we look at the demonic realm, demons are powerful, Satan is powerful, but when they look at Jesus, they're like, oh crap, it's a police officer, fine, I'll slow down, fine, I'll pull over. 
because he's got delegated power from the Father. So what about power? Power is the Greek word dunamis, means miraculous supernatural, miraculous supernatural power or ability of God. It's where we get the words dynamite from, dynamic, dinosaur, you know, terrible lizard, come from the word, it comes from the word dun dunamis, power, miraculous power. It's used, this word is used 119 times in the New Testament. Um, out of a, the New Testament uses 5,437 different Greek words. Uh, out of all those, there are only 124 words used more often than the word power, dunamis. It's, a ver it's used all throughout the New Testament. It's, a ver it, it's scattered all over the place. And of, of those 124 words that are used more often than dunamis, that includes words like God, the Lord, the, well, not really the, sorry, that's not a Greek word, uh, God, the Lord, um, uh, what did I have here, and, or, but, uh, so, for, with, of, are, is, you know, words that you would, ex you know, those words are going to be used everywhere. So the word power is high up there in its use in the New Testament. And so we should really pay attention to it. Um, the way that it's used, like, like English, the, like in English, Greek has words that can be used multiple different ways. And same thing with the word dunamis. Um, it's used to mean general power or strength of someone, the general power of God. It can mean supernatural power. Um, beings, powers, and authorities in the heavenly places, but the majority of times that it's used, it's used to mean supernatural, miraculous power to heal the sick or cast out demons. 49% um, of uses in the whole New Testament are used to mean that, miraculous power of God. 66% of uses in the Gospels are about the miraculous power of God. 100% of uses of dunamis in the book of Acts are about the supernatural, miraculous power of God. So when we talk about Jesus walking in power and having power, it's about supernatural, miraculous power. Not just like, oh, Jesus had power to, you know, uh, Mary made a, a pan of brownies and Jesus walked past them, had power to resist. And he didn't eat the brownies. No, that's not what the New Testament is talking about when it says power. When it talks about Jesus' power, he had miraculous power to defeat the enemy, to heal the sick, to cast out demons. In a... In Luke 4, Jesus is in the wilderness being tempted by the enemy. And right after he's tempted by the enemy, it says that he left the wilderness, went back to civilization in the power of the Holy Spirit. And right away after that, that launches Jesus into going from city to city, casting out demons, healing the sick, dismantling the kingdom of the enemy. Luke 5, it says that the power of, the, the power of God was with Jesus to heal. And that's the chapter where we see the, uh, the paralytic get healed, where the, Jesus is in a house and so many people are getting healed and so many people are getting delivered from demons that nobody can get in the house. It's just packed. And so these guys, who, friends of this paralytic guy, they're like, well, how do we get our friend in there? So they, they cut a hole in the roof and lower their friend down so Jesus can heal him. That's because the power of God was with Jesus. Um, in Luke 8, we see Jesus uh, walking through this crowd of people and there's a woman with a, a flow of blood for 12 years no doctors can heal her. She's just in misery as a result of this thing. But one, then she touches Jesus and Jesus goes, I felt power leave my body. And the woman's boom, she's instantly healed. That's power. So when we talk about Jesus walking in power, it's not a weak thing. It's not just some theoretical kind of thing or some theological concept. It means the power to deliver people from the works of the enemy, to see people healed, to see demons cast out. Miraculous power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If, if authority is seeing the police officer's car or the siren goes on or the lights go on, the power would be uh, that, you know, let's, let's say, okay, let's say uh, my Highway 60 run from the law there. Um, let's say, you know, imagine that scenario again. The, I see the police, you know, he does a U-turn. I see his lights go on and then I go, I don't respect his authority. So I floor it. I start going. It's a high speed chase. Well, now this guy calls back up. Now there's 10 cars behind, you know, he's behind me, 10 cars with him. And then there's other guys coming from the other direction. They're surrounding me. And now I've got to stop the car. They all get out. They've got their guns pointed at me. Now they're showing, look, you disrespected our authority. We've got power to make you stop. If you don't surrender now, we will shoot you. That's like power. So authority is the badge or seeing the car. Power is the gun, the actual being able to cause harm. And so when, I, when, we think of, when we look at Jesus, he's got this authority where the enemy, the enemy recognizes it. 
And if there's a demon in somebody, the demon recognizes it. And so, but if the demon chooses to resist, doesn't leave, doesn't submit to Jesus, Jesus has power, miraculous power, to cast that demon out and make him submit. So Jesus has power and he has authority. And we see, we see in the scriptures that the enemy has a level of power. The enemy has a level of authority. He's tough. He's smart. He's wise. He's vicious. He's cruel. He's, Peter says he's prowling around us like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So we need to be aware of what he's doing and, and the way that he works. But compared to Jesus, he's nothing. His power is nothing. It's just tiny. So let me, let me close with a verse. Just uh, kind of, so next week I want to talk about how we have, so Jesus walked in power, Jesus walked in authority, he showed that definitively in his life. There's no question about it when we look at the Gospels, when we look at the New Testament, the authority and the power that Jesus walked in. But he, he it didn't, when he ascended to the Father, the authority that he had, he spread it to us. He commissioned us and gave us the same power and the same authority that he had. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. And Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. There's a number of times where Jesus sends his disciples out. He sent the twelve out um, here. He sends uh, the 70 or 72 out later on. And then in the Great Commission, he sends all the church out. And every time Jesus sends people out, he sends them out the same. He, gives the, he sends them out with his authority and with his power to heal the sick and to cast out demons. So the, the power that Jesus walked in, the authority that he walked in, that's ours. The enemy doesn't get to torment us. The enemy doesn't get to ruin our lives. He doesn't get to send us nightmares, send us addictions, send us, send us uh, sins that just ensnare us all the time. He doesn't get to send us um, his torment and his destruction. We can stand against that. We can stand in the power that Jesus had and transferred to us, imparted to us. We can stand in that, that power and that authority, and we can resist what the enemy is doing. So next week, I'm going to talk more about that. Um, but I think that that's good for now. Jesus has all power and all authority. So let's walk in it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. All right, let me, let me pray. Jesus, I want to thank you for the power and the authority that you have. Thank you for bringing a new kingdom to the earth, that we are not bound to the old ways any longer. We're not bound to the old king, the old illegitimate king, that, his, that the enemy's lies and deception, the enemy's sin, the enemy's sickness, the enemy's torment that he brings in our lives, that it's invalid because a new king has come. Jesus, I pray that, that we would see your power and your authority manifest in our lives, that we would see your kingdom manifest in our lives and wherever the enemy is hurting us, wherever he's tormenting us, wherever he's brought fear or worry or, or um, sin, addiction, any kind of torment, we stand against it in the name of Jesus and we declare that Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our King. Jesus has ultimate power and ultimate authority. He is the King of our lives and no illegitimate King is allowed to rule. In Jesus' name, amen.